As the Money Burns is an original podcast by Nikki Woodard. Based on historical research, this is a deep exploration into what happened to a set of actual heirs and heiresses to some of America's most famous fortunes when the Great Depression hit. Each episode has three primary sections. Section 1 is an heir to story. Section 2 goes deeper into the historical facts. Section 3 focuses on contemporary, emotional, and personal connections. Story Recap Secrets blossom inside darkness. A royal love triangle ends in divorce. The richest heir elopes with a simpler girl, while a rejected gambler ends his life. Now back to As the Money Burns. Pomp and Circumstance. Heiress's dream of royal romances with fairy tale endings. As one marries her prince, another dances with a future king. Section 1 Story Friday, May 15th, 1931, Early Morning. A beaming bright smile as the not so blushing bride clutches her bouquet of calla lilies next to her prince. Not a figurative prince, an actual prince. The day has arrived when wealthy socialite, the it girl debutante of her season, Louise Astor Van Allen, marries Russian prince Alexis Divani. Louise met the prince through her brothers, who were classmates back at Eton together. Over the years, the young couple slowly developed a romance over exchanging secret letters. When the rest of the family found out, a huge row occurred. Her mother, socialite Daisy Van Allen, fired Louise's longtime German governess for abetting the situation while brothers Henry and Sam Van Allen are equally upset and feeling betrayed over the seduction of their younger sister after so benevolently taking care of the penniless prince all these years. Louise is not only a highly ranked and proper socialite in the 1930s, but is the great-granddaughter of the reigning society queen, Caroline Astor. Louise's pending nuptials has gathered quite a bit of press and speculation. At first, lots of anticipation on the future grand event, Then the oddest thing happens. It is the most downplayed and demure affair. Inside the Wakehurst drawing room, where Louise was christened as a baby, the couple stands without attendance in front of Reverend Stanley Carnahan of Trinity Church. The massive stone fireplace is nearly concealed with white lilies, roses, yellow calla lilies, and talisman roses with ferns and palms in the background. Dressed in a brown traveling suit with a corsage of lilies of the valley and gardenias, Louise is betrothed to Alexis. Only close family members on Louise's side attend, including Daisy's sister Rose Spriggy Post Howard and nephew Thomas Howard. Henry and his wife Eleanor have their own newborn baby boy with them. As for the royals, Alexis keeps his Divani siblings at bay. His brothers stay in Hollywood with their paramours while his sisters and father remain in Europe. After the ceremony and simple reception, the newlyweds motor to New York to board the Ile de France ocean liner later that afternoon and head to London for an extended honeymoon and motor tour of Europe. Traveling on the same ship is none other than Franklin Hutton in a race to join his wife and daughter, also in London. Weeks earlier, teenage heiress, now debutante, Barbara Hutton crossed the pond on her way to be presented at the Court of St. James. Like Doris Duke before her, Barbara will curtsy in front of King George V and Queen Mary. Her father, Franklin Hutton, arranged her participation to lure Barbara away from her ardent admirer, the dangerous playboy millionaire, Phil Plant, who snuck aboard last minute on the ocean liner on which Barbara and her stepmother, Irene, traveled. Franklin rushes to thwart another disastrous pending engagement announcement. The chubby, budding fashionista Barbara is one of 20 Americans to be presented, and among the 11 to appear in the first court of the season, which is when all the big fashion trends will be set for this year. Her fascination with royalty and envy over Doris's prior bout ensure that Barbara should be thrilled with the opportunity. Only preceding circumstances are dampening enthusiasm. The marriage of Prince Alexis to Louise instead of Sylvia, the recent death of Uncle James Donahue Sr., and a vicious sore throat that might lead to tonsillitis threatens Barbara's attendance at the royal event. London 
Great Britain, Tuesday, May 19, 1931, at 9 p.m. After hours of waiting, the procession begins. Averting last year's traffic delays, vehicles were not allowed to line up until 6 p.m. as most presentations are given by order of arrival. Young ladies, attendants, and onlookers gather in the mall and entertain themselves until the zero hour arrives. When the gates open, the ladies enter and pass by the fountain and other marvelous sights. God Saves the King plays as King George V in a scarlet colonel-in-chief uniform of the Scots Guards is accompanied by Queen Mary, whose silvery hair is adorned with a diamond tiara and wears a pink chiffon gown with a diamond and pearl corsage and the blue baldric order of the garter. Lord Chamberlain precedes them as he walks in reverse in deference. After their majesties sit upon their gold thrones in the white and gold ballroom, the introductions begin as the Grenadier Guard's string band plays lightly in the background. Most young ladies are elated over the opportunity, and many secretly wish that also present will be the handsome Prince of Wales, as he is the ultimate Deb's delight. The still bachelor Prince David has yet to find his princess. Well, not publicly at least. Right now, he seems to favor one particular Viscountess, an American married to British nobility, Thelma Morgan Furness, who regularly performs the hostessing duties around him. Her identical twin sister, Gloria Morgan Vanderbilt, is the widow of the heir, Reginald Vanderbilt. The fashionable night brings lots of excitement and attention. The colors of gowns will be mostly shades of white, with some in varying pastel hues of pink and blue. Among the attendees at Buckingham Palace, the Sultan of Johor and his wife, the Sultana, formerly Mrs. Helen Wilson, a Scottish widow. The latter appears with Indian state jewels, the Johor tiara with pigeon egg-sized diamonds, and one collar of flawless diamonds with another collar worked into the lace design of her rose-pink Jerisa Bengali gown. Her husband, the Sultan, accompanies her in a blue-gold uniform with the requisite knee breeches. All men are in knee breeches except the American ambassador, Charles Dawes, who remains in a full slacks black tuxedo. He really hates this ceremony in all its pomp and circumstance and fanfare. Once again, the American's ambassador's wife, Mrs. Dawes, will present the American ladies, including her own daughter, Virginia Dawes, 17 and the youngest to be presented. The first ladies presented have similar international diplomatic status, including the daughters of the Chinese minister and the Japanese ambassador. Fighting her sore throat, Barbara nervously consumes lozenge after lozenge. On the way to the palace, she stopped and got a few more. When the signal is given for all to proceed in, the various debutantes, ladies and matrons, emerge from their vehicle sporting the Prince of Wales plume, three large white ostrich feathers. One young lady's plume catches on the doorframe and nearly rips from her head. She breaks down in tears as her attendants aid in her recovery. The other nearly 400 ladies wait for their turn, stepping forward past the fountain and eventually onto the ballroom. Overwhelmed, Barbara sips the champagne as another young lady assures her it will calm the nerves. Young Virginia, too, seems overly anxious and tense. She winces and pauses as her stomach tightens, then composes herself before heading first into the ballroom. The diplomatic young ladies will take their seats after their bows and wait until the end of the ceremony while others will immediately file into an adjoining reception room. A dizzying whirr. There is the royal court with the Duke and Duchess of York, Princess Alice, and the King and Queen. The dashing Prince of Wales is noticeably absent, detained by the delay of the artist's dinner he attends earlier. Buzzing from the champagne, Barbara makes her approach with the appropriate curtsies. She has practiced endlessly the deep curtsy in hopes of not falling over or tripping. As she approaches the throne, Barbara notices the king's drowsy eyes almost nodding off to sleep out of sheer and utter boredom. The queen, similarly, is less than thrilled over the endless parade of blurring beauties as she forces smiles and nods when necessary. After the reception, many gather in an adjoining room for refreshments and supper. Queen Mary graciously moves throughout the group and has little intimate conversations with select friends. She takes a passing interest in the young American heiress with the beautiful deep blue eyes, Barbara. Still a bit under the weather, Barbara attends the requisite after events. 
She removes her elaborate feather headpiece as considered peculiar court symbols. Surprisingly, she meets none other than David, Prince of Wales. He is both tipsy and charming, then catches his mother eyeing them. He asks for Barbara's hand. They dance as the queen watches on. Mutterings occur that it might be preferential for this prince to change his affections from one married American to this young available heiress. Before the night ends, Prince David graciously invites Barbara to a garden party. Confused and excited, Barbara accepts. The next morning, Miss Virginia Dawes is rushed to the hospital and has an appendectomy. Though advised to have it sooner, she postponed the surgery until after the big event. No one would dare to miss such a chance. The next evening at the second court, Prince David appears in a scarlet Welsh Guards colonel uniform with his brother Prince George and greets the debutantes. Unfortunately, Barbara's cousin Helena McCann falls gravely ill with influenza and is forced to postpone her royal moment until the third court in June before her own official debut this September at Oyster Bay. Once a lady is presented at court, she is free to attend all sorts of activities, including the royal ascot, endless opportunities to mingle with the upper echelon. As Barbara prepares for more royal-related activities, she might have a surprise announcement to make of her own soon. Heiresses becoming princesses and maybe even queens sounds like dreams coming true. But remember, fairy tales always have a dark side. Section 2, History and Historiography <laughs> Okay, so this collision of events has been one of the main reasons I needed to tell this story about multiple people during this particular period of time. I first discovered the concept of this story within a gossip column detailing the events of one summer in Newport, Rhode Island, shortly before the Wall Street crash of October 1929. To reconstruct the error, I did lots and lots of research to find out where something happened, who was there, what were their connections, and what were the parallels, and so on and so on. I was delighted when I learned both Barbara Hutton and Doris Duke were in the mix, as both have fascinated me after seeing two different miniseries about them. Now learning they were there as teens, I needed to figure out what that entails for this set of stories. In any and all biographies, I am endlessly curious about how the time from adolescence into adulthood shapes a person and where many get stuck in lifelong patterns. I've had to go through many, many segues, side notes, and fleshing out details, but this is where the story started to really unfold and make sense. If you two are familiar with the history, you might know about the love triangle between Barbara Hutton, Prince Alexis Devani, and Louise Van Allen. Now, the only person in that triangle that has any significant literature is Barbara Hutton. She comes up a lot in the cautionary tales of extreme wealth. She has multiple biographies, a mini-series based off of one in particular, and the most problematic at that, and numerous documentaries. All take a large sweeping scale of her whole life, and there is so much to cover it just rushes by. Thus, you only get a few glimpses into this era of her life. And within that, Prince Divani gets some attention, while Louise is quickly and summarily dismissed. Surely Louise and the prince might have more written about them somewhere. Something to give me a perspective beyond the ones from and about Barbara only. Long before the pandemic, when I was really trying to decide how to tell this story, who to include, where to go, I would peruse the UCLA newspaper archives trying to suss out more, more, more. I would think of a topic and download articles compiling over 2,000 to verify dates, order, sequence, and other details. Try to sort out what is plausible and interesting. I had recurring topics I would continually look up to see if a different angle yielded anything new and revelatory. When reconstructing the timeline of events, I learned Barbara bowed before the King and Queen of England in May 1931. Well, then I was curious and looked up the wedding of Louise Van Allen and Prince Alexis Devani, also in May 1931. When I saw how closely the dates were together, other things made more sense and far more complex. 
Shockingly, the royal fan Barbara is noted as being miserable throughout the entire Buckingham Palace event. The previous teetotaler finally sipped champagne to alleviate nerves, but her sadness seemed way off in feel. Then, through newspapers, I learned the timing of the Van Allen Devani wedding. It made far more sense. And only within this last week did I learn, through other similar sources, of Barbara's sore throat. I have chosen not to always list my sources. One, it would become tediously trying to cite every book, website, magazine article, and especially newspaper article to clarify my point. It would also ruin part of the surprises in store. By the way, I am now up to over 3,500 news articles with over 85% period. Many will duplicate the same story, but will add a new detail here and there. I mean, I only recently caught the Sultana of Johor, Helena Makan's delayed bow and sickness, and Virginia Dawes' appendicitis, with one sentence throwaways inside news articles covering the Buckingham courts with all the exact same repetitive details. Then amongst so many unreliable sources, there is the complication of speculation, rumor, gossip, and misremembrances, which further complicate reconstruction. I have to both reinterpret information, Johor is now part of Malaysia, not India, but I have to continually question and verify, did an intended event actually happen? And how is it interpreted much later in recall? Those familiar might know the biographies, which even those give me trouble as they continuously get ages, dates, and chronological sequences wrong. Really, really bad on the non-subjects, but even worse when it involves the primary subject. It happens far too much. Though I have to admit the digital age has given me wonderful access to newspaper archives that wouldn't have been available when those had been written. The authors, however, could interview people and get more ambience and perspective, even if facts like dates are wrong. That is why these two moments, the Van Allen Devani wedding and Barbara at Buckingham Palace, this timing, this chronological sequence, and the details matter. It might seem trivial, but in so many other ways, it is not. Knowing what is coinciding adds far more depth to a situation that will have a grave impact on those involved. I hope you stay tuned as the rest of the story unfolds. Section 3, Contemporary and Personal Relevance We are only a few weeks away from the Trooping the Color balcony ceremony for Queen Elizabeth II's Platinum Jubilee, celebrating her 70 years on the British throne. The prior longest reigning British monarch was Queen Victoria on the throne just shy of 64 years. According to Wikipedia, the longest reigning monarch of record is French King Louis XIV at 72 years and 110 days, who died in 1715 at the age 77. Queen Elizabeth II will soon surpass the Thailand King, please forgive the pronunciation, Thailand King Bumbumbuang Adunyade, also known as Rama IX, who died in 2016 at age 88. At the time of this episode, there is roughly 30 days left between their two reigns. For our contemporary period, the Thai king was the longest reigning head of state after the death of former Emperor Hirohito in 1989. Queen Victoria is eighth on the list of the longest reigns. Like I have said before, I have long been waiting to discuss this particular episode for years, and now it coincides with a huge related event. Barbara Hutton's close encounters with David the Prince of Wales is an interesting near miss and a potential avenue for what if had things turned out differently. I mean, there could have been an American queen, a whole different royal line of succession than the one we know now, and an even closer possibility than the one in which Meghan Markle married Prince Harry, the former second but already six in line for the throne by the time of their wedding. This is not the only such situation in our tales. I first caught a reference to this chance encounter, but now it is much more clear how Barbara and Prince David will be linked over the rest of their lives. Though it has only been suggested in biographies on Barbara that his mother, Queen Mary, had some interest or possible acceptance of the heiress, mostly to thwart the bachelor prince's proclivities for married women, especially as his last two will be Americans before taking the throne in 1936. 
Ironically, as King Edward VIII, David will have one of the shortest reigns in British history with 326 days, not even a full year. Lady Jane Grey had only nine days in 1553, and King Edgar the Aetheline had two months and twelve days in 1066 before yielding to William the Conqueror. It is interesting that in a biography, Bachelor Prince by Fraser Hunt, on Prince David, dated in 1935, one year prior to his succession, there is reference to his young niece, Princess Elizabeth, and her potential rise to the throne if David has no children of his own. It seemed preposterous then, as he was highly desirable, and no one would have foreseen the chaos to have come soon enough. As we continue our tales, Prince David will make several more appearances along with other royals. He has a later history with Barbara's aunt Jessie Woolworth Donahue and cousin Jimmy Donahue Jr., referred in this series by his private nickname, Jim. So this prince's storyline is far from over. Such complicated tales we unweave while uncovering all that might deceive. Curious to learn more about other royal histories? Check out the Queen's podcast by Katie Hearn Church and Nathan Foster, which features female monarchs, nobles, and other powerful women throughout history and around the world. From the most popular to the less familiar, Catherine the Great, Hypatia of Alexandria and Bodicia, to Amina of Zarya and Jadwiga of Poland. Katie and Nathan discuss the very aspects of these women and their times while trying a specially themed cocktail recipe. That is the Queen's Podcast. Next, when we return to As the Money Burns, many things can happen inside a garden. Will another royal romance bloom? Or forbidden fruit prove too tempting? Until then. As the Money Burns is an original podcast written, produced, and voiced by Nikki Woodard based on historical research. Archival music has been provided by Past Perfect Vintage Music. Check out their website at www.pastperfect.com. Please come visit us at As the Money Burns via Good Pods, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Transcripts, timeline, episode guide, and character bios are available at asthemoneyburns.com.